what can I expect when I light the fuse, right? I'm lighting the fuse. I'm going to sue another person. What is this going to entail? And I try to give them the best information I have. I'll, I'll tell them about what it's like to try and reach an attorney, uh, go through the intake process, what it's like when the case starts and what you can expect, and then ultimately what it's like when that, if that life-changing moment happens where you're able to get recovery, uh, when you're able to get that check. I can share the trial attorney perspective on what it takes to succeed in an employment case from the time that you're fired all the way through working with the attorney to the point of getting either a verdict or an excellent settlement. It's so important to be able to understand the process so that you're working with the process and going with the flow instead of feeling like everything's going against you and, and you're just not sure where you're headed. You can't reach your destination if you don't know where you're going. And so uh, I always feel it's important to educate um, clients about the important aspects of litigation and I'm so happy to be able to do that here today. When somebody calls the Bone Law Group for the first time, what should people expect to take place in that initial phone call? What kind of questions will they have to answer? When people call Bohm Law Group, they should be prepared to talk about what happened to them. We're going to need some basic information. We're going to need to know what bad things happened to them, when did the bad things happen to them, and what evidence, if any, do they have to help support the, their case. It's not a long conversation to start. It's, it's just enough so that we, the lawyers, can figure out if it's even worth your time to uh, to meet with somebody to discuss your case. When somebody calls the Bone Law Group, who are they going to talk to? When somebody calls us, the most important thing is that we pick up the phone and that we have somebody available to talk to them. So we have trained support staff who are actually there waiting to take a call and to start the process of helping a person deal with what they've been through. At the Bone Law Group, the most important thing to us is that people are able to be heard. So we have support staff who are trained and ready to answer the phone, to ask the questions that need to be asked, and to help get the information ready so that the attorneys can review it and decide if this person is somebody we can help. I assume you don't take every single case uh, that comes your way, so what kind of review are the attorneys doing, and how long generally does it take to get back to people? At the Bohm Law Group, we don't take every case. Uh, we can only take the cases where people have met the criteria where we can go into a court and get them justice. Uh, so for the most part, we collect about 20 minutes to 30 minutes worth of information, general information about the case. And then we'll present that to the attorneys for review. Uh, this process can take anywhere from a day to two days, depending on how much information and how many other people are contacting the group. And then we'll get back to the person and give them some direction in terms of whether they require consultation or whether they should continue looking for an attorney or whether they're just not ready yet. Assuming that the potential client does have a case and the Bohm Law Group agrees to represent them, how do clients pay for the legal services? Do they pay by the hour or do they pay a percentage of the recovery, i.e. a contingency fee? Most clients don't have, after they've just lost their job, they don't have the ability to pay by the hour. Uh, so that's just not realistic. And uh, almost none of our cases are paid for by the hour because almost none of our clients can actually afford to pay that kind of money, nor would I ever recommend that they do so. Uh, you know, we, we take on this work with tremendous risk because we do it without being paid, but instead being paid a percentage of what we're able to recover for our clients. And uh, that puts us in a partnership with our clients. And we're happy to be in a partnership with our clients because then the client can be certain that we're working the case because they know 
that if we don't work, we don't get paid. And we can be certain that the client's going to participate in the case because let's face it, we can't win, we can't succeed without our client participating and giving us the data that we need to prevail. So after somebody signs the paperwork and officially becomes a client, what are the next steps? So the very first step after we've signed the paperwork and begun the process is data mining. We are mining data. We are working with the client. We are having very long conversations, not just one, not just two, not just three, not just with one person, not just with the paralegal. We are getting multiple attorneys involved, everybody asking about the story, having the story repeated, penetrating deep into the story to make sure that everything makes sense. We have to know the facts as best we can know them. And then we never stop. We never stop wanting to learn more. Our client only knows the forward-facing information, what they were told. But after we file our complaint, after we've started the lawsuit, then we'll get to dig in deeper and we'll start to learn facts behind the curtain. But before we go behind the curtain, we want to nail down every fact, every bit of data that we can nail down about what happened to you, how it happened to you, when it happened to you, who did this to you, where did it occur? These are the fundamental who, what, where, when, how, and of course, most importantly, why did this happen? So that's what, I mean, we're off to the races. As soon as the client is signed up, we are off to the races to make sure that we are writing down the facts, memorializing these facts, collecting the evidence that our client may or may not even be aware that they have and putting that all together in a case file so that way we can move forward to the second stage which is peeking behind the curtain. A lot of people tend to assume that as soon as they hire an attorney like you, the company is going to be just terrified and want to settle immediately. Is this true? If that were true, then uh, certainly we at the Bohm Law Group would be amongst the most terrifying. Um, that's, there's no doubt about that. Unfortunately, I can tell you as one of the boogeymen for companies, uh, they don't just pay us. I wish they would, but most of the time I have to prove them wrong, right? Most of the time they will tell me that we don't have a case, uh, that we're never going to win, and then after the verdict rolls in is when they get their education and they realize that maybe they should have been listening. But no, uh, companies in, in this country couldn't function if every time somebody threatened litigation, they just open their pocketbook. In fact, it's the uh, exact opposite. Companies think that uh, they're going to get a reputation for paying money. And so they go out of their way to be unreasonable as if, Every plaintiff is talking to each other. Every person is talking to each other and is going to say, well, don't sue that company because they put me through hell. The reality is, uh, unless the case is uh, very unusual, and that, that would mean like we've got them caught red-handed on video, right? Like caught red-handed. Uh, and even then, they still will not pay right away. So, um, you know, the, 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 the normal thing over all of these years uh, is that it's going to take a while, usually two to four years before your case is actually done. After the lawsuit is filed in court, generally, how does the company react to it? You ever walk up to a beehive with a stick and hit it? That's how a company's gonna react. They're gonna feel threatened. They're gonna feel like they need to circle the wagons. They're gonna go get their fancy pants lawyers and they're gonna have them by the dozen. And it's going to be a, a, a massive force that is committed to the proposition of protecting corporate assets. That's what you're going to see. After the case is filed in court, what should the client expect to happen next? After the defendant gets their attorneys in place, uh, they're going to respond to the complaint. Uh, we call that an answer. And after that point, then a new stage of the case will begin and it's called discovery. And it, it's just like the channel, the discovery channel. Uh, it's going to be all about exploring facts and information, each side having the ability to talk to the other side's witnesses, 
to get documents about what happened in this case and to uh, explore and discover uh, the truth about what happened. So um, discovery is an involved process. It takes uh, a, a fair amount of time because it's a process. Uh, a question gets asked, they have the right to object. If they object, you have the right to challenge their objection. If you can't come to an agreement about uh, the answer that should be provided, then the court gets involved and decides whether or not the question should be answered. So this is a, a process that takes time, it takes expertise, uh, it takes somebody who is committed to finding the truth and who's not going to back down just because there's a, a squadron of lawyers on the other side trying to make it difficult. Generally, what are the different types of discovery? All right, so there's, there are essentially some basics that you're going to see in every case that the Bohm Law Group does. I, I can't speak for others because we do discovery a little bit different than everybody else. Uh, first thing, of course, everybody's going to send interrogatories. That's a fancy word for questions. Right, written questions, they can get sent to my client and, they can, and we can send them to the corporation and have them answer. These are important, uh, but they're not the end of the story. There's also something called a request for production of documents. This is one of the keys. This is one of the main and most important discovery devices. It's where one side gets to ask the other side to please produce all documents regarding this topic. So. Uh, we send a lot of requests for productions. Some cases have hundreds of requests for production of documents. Another device is called request for admissions. This is where one side asks the other side to admit a particular and specific fact. If they don't admit that fact and it turns out that you prove that fact at trial, there can be some pretty dicey consequences including having to pay attorney's fees and or costs. Another important discovery device that we use at the Bohm Law Group, and frankly, I don't, I don't think people use it enough, is called a request for site inspection. I love this discovery device because essentially we're going to take you and we're going back to your workplace and we're walking in the front door with you right next to your lawyer and we're looking at every single place that you worked so that we can understand what you've been through, how the facts come together, whether witnesses could have heard or seen specific things that happened in your case. So uh, we've been to hospitals, we've been to construction sites, we've been to uh, schools, we've been to uh, government facilities that are otherwise classified that you can't get in. Um, but you can get in with the power of a site inspection. And so uh, we're very much uh, in support of doing that. So it's also important to note that these various written discovery devices, the, the questions, the admissions, the request for production of documents, th those are done in sets. So we'll send a set, we'll look at what has come back, and then we'll send a second set that's penetrating deeper into the data, looking for more specific information. Then when we get that back, we'll do it again. And we will keep going back to the mine, so to speak, farming out this data until we're certain that we've gotten everything that the defendant has that they can possibly give us that is on the subject that we're investigating. Aside from written discovery, which you just went through, I know there's things called depositions. Can you tell me about that? The deposition is the precursor to a trial. The deposition is a, is a time when the attorney asks a witness questions. Every deposition has a court reporter who is typing down every word that's being said on the record. Uh, and the record begins when the deposition starts. People take breaks, you go off the record but everything that's on the record is being typed up into a booklet that is under penalty of perjury that the parties can use during the trial. That's why a deposition is like a precursor to the trial. Um, the corporations think that the uh, deposition of the plaintiff is the most important part of the case. Um, and for that reason, a skilled trial attorney should make sure that the plaintiff is ready and prepared for their deposition. Uh, likewise, um, 
when you're trying to build a case and you're looking behind the curtain to see what happened, it's very important that you take depositions of the uh, co-workers, the managers, the decision makers, the people who are at the core of the case in terms of witnessing the who, what, where, when, how, and why uh, this case has happened. What happens if people lie during their deposition? Lying at a deposition is the number one way to lose your case. So, on the one hand, when it comes to Bohm Law Group clients, uh, well, that just simply doesn't happen because uh, the clients are well aware that the only thing that they can do to ruin their case is to lie. We can handle the truth about everything as long as they tell the truth. The, the positive side of this is the corporate witnesses, they don't, they don't seem to get this message. So lying happens very often in deposition and uh, quite frankly, we do nothing to discourage it because if the corporate witnesses are going to lie, then in the contest of he said versus she said, Nobody's going to believe the corporate witnesses who are caught lying. So lying ruins credibility. Ruined credibility leads to defeat at trial. What if the company doesn't give you the documents or the answers that you want in discovery? Does the court force them? In every case, there are issues where the parties do not agree about whether one side should get a certain bit of data that they're looking for, okay? Whether it's that the plaintiff wants to get something and the defendant won't give it to him, or the defendant wants to get something and the plaintiff won't give it to him. That happens in almost every case. And the way that that ends up re getting resolved is the court will hear both sides, what, is it, what it is that is being sought, and then the court will decide whether or not the other side has to produce it. But the reality is, you can't get blood from a stone. So ultimately, if the other side's going to destroy the evidence or get rid of the evidence, you're not going to get the evidence. That's just the reality of it. But the jury gets to know that there should be something there and it's otherwise missing. So many times, a skilled lawyer will let it go. If they want to say that they don't have any incident report about the harassment, even though everybody said it happened, so be it. Um, you have to be smart about how you approach the court in terms of getting information that they're not giving you and decide whether or not you want to really make the court go through it because eventually the court gets tired of it and will stop being so uh, helpful with regard to this exercise of forcing the other side to give the information. So, um, so you really just have to trust the process and then think a more big picture sense of how can I use the fact that they won't give us this information against them? And if you can, well then you really don't need to bother the court. If they don't, if they don't wanna give you their investigation files, well, guess what? You're not going to see those investigation files at your trial either. So um, you really just have to uh, rely on a trained attorney to decide whether or not it's really worth going after because there are risks to going after the information as well. If you're not successful, the court may sanction you. Uh, if you're not successful, the court may say something that now emboldens the other side to not give you even more data. So you really need to be cautious about when you're asking to get the court involved and make a good, intelligent decision. I've heard that most cases never go to trial. Is that true? It is true that most cases will not go to trial. And let me tell you why. It's because there's a lot of risk to the corporations if they lose an employment trial. Not only will they have to pay the damages that they cause to an individual, but they're also going to have to pay attorney's fees in most cases. And that could be as much as a half a million to a million dollars or more just in attorney's fees if they lose. So there's a very high risk 
of terrible outcome to companies. Also, they're frequently embarrassed by verdicts that showcase their illegal conduct. So uh, you have to be patient in litigation because what they're doing is they circle the wagons and then they just try to starve you out, right? They try to make you wait so long that you give up. But for the people who uh, have the courage of their convictions and are reasonable, uh, if you just hang in there and you trust your lawyer, you're going to get to a point where you're probably going to settle your case. And by the way, if that point doesn't come and you are going to end up in trial, that's when you really need an experienced attorney to help you understand, well, what are the risks? What are the chances of winning versus the chances of losing? And I always try to put that to my clients in a this many out of 10. We've got a 5 out of 10 shot, a 7 out of 10 shot. But a good lawyer should be recommending that you hold your ground when your case is 6, 7, 8, 9 out of 10 times that they expect they would win it. You've got to stand strong and you've got to be able to survive the delay. And there's always going to be a delay. The better your case, the more delay they sh you should expect. If most cases do not go to trial, um, does the Bohm Law Group have to prepare all these cases for trial and go through the big ugly discovery process? The reason that the majority of, and I can only speak to Bohm Law Group here, the reason that the majority of the Bohm Law Group cases that, that they do not go to trial is because we're prepared for trial. We're ready for trial. We're daring them to, to go to trial. And it's that preparedness, it's that attention to detail, and it's that courage and uh, confidence that causes the other side to buckle and ultimately come to the table with a settlement that is reasonable and fair to both sides. Assuming the case doesn't settle and it goes to trial, generally what happens at trial? What are the steps and stages? The most important step in terms of preparing for trial is making sure that you have actually collected all the data that you need. All the witnesses have been spoken to. All the depositions have been taken. The experts that you need for your case, most employment cases will require at least an economist. Sometimes also when there is extreme emotional distress, we will also have a psychologist helping out in the case and potentially other experts in terms of human resources, maybe even bullying. But you have to get all of these people ready, get your exhibits ready, get your outlines ready, uh, and then you're ready to show up to the trial court who will ask you, are your exhibits ready? Yes, Your Honor. They'll ask you, are your witnesses ready? Yes, Your Honor. They'll ask you, is there any reason why this trial cannot proceed? And as long as your answer to that question is no, the next step is that you'll meet your trial judge and they'll set a schedule for when this trial is going to actually happen. You'll pick your jury, you'll, prevent, you'll present your evidence, and you'll arrive at a verdict. Generally, how long does trial take? Uh, generally, the, the process from the time that you pick a jury to the time that you get a verdict will be about three weeks to a month. If a client wins at trial, what kind of damages do they recover? When a client wins at trial, usually the jury has sat and listened to the story for at least a week or two. That jury feels invested in the story. They don't think that they're sitting on a case that's worthless or silly or frivolous. They think that they're sitting on a case that's involving important laws and fairness. And so generally speaking, if a jury finds the case for my clients, they're, they're considering hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, depending on the story and how much has been lost. But um, in no situation do I ever expect that a jury will award my client less than a six-figure verdict because if we're taking the case to trial, that means there's been real unlawful conduct happening and that somebody has been really impacted by that. So um, I always expect the verdicts to be six figures, seven figures, depending on the harm and what the client's been through. All right, how often do employment 
cases get appealed by either you, the, the plaintiff attorney, or the company's attorneys? So when we're talking about appeal, we're talking about mistakes. Not mistakes necessarily that the lawyers made, but mistakes that the court can make. And I can tell you that as an officer of the court, as all lawyers are, we're not supposed to say anything, of course, negative about the courts, nor do I intend to. But the courts, they're run by human beings, and human beings make mistakes. They can mistakenly prevent evidence from coming in that should come in, or they can mistakenly do other things in the case. The reality is, at Bohm Law Group, uh, we're not usually the ones who file the appeal. Usually, appeals are filed by the losing party. Uh, we don't lose very often. Uh, so, but we have had circumstances where judges have made mistakes. In fact, in one of our cases that we did up in Nevada County, the court made a mistake, took away our $3 million verdict for a man who was still employed at Caltrans, and then we appealed that. And the appellate court said, no, the judge made a mistake. And the court gave us back our $3 million verdict. So yes, we will have to file appeals. But usually the appeal happens after we've kicked out their front teeth and they've got a big verdict. And now they're just spiraling, trying to figure out what they're going to do about it. So yeah, we see a lot of appeals uh, from corporations because we do a lot of winning in the trial court. And when you win in the trial court, you win yourself an appeal. And that's a great place to be because if they're appealing your verdict, it means that you did a great job in court. When do most employment cases settle in the life cycle of the case? Is it early? Is it in discovery? Is it right before trial? When does it generally happen? So settlement happens when, uh, when the parties sort of realize that they have enough information to predict with a degree of confidence what they think is likely to happen. So some cases you're able to arrive at that information earlier because the witnesses are available or the evidence is available. And in some cases it may take years because it took years to get the key witnesses and the depositions and the information. So it really just depends. There is no bright line rule, but obviously you want to settle your case at a time where you can get the maximum value and you can give your client that cushion that they're looking for. So once the evidence kind of becomes more clear to the parties, how does the topic of settlement even come up? Is there a third party that comes in and helps with settlement? Uh, the topic of settlement comes up in every case automatically because the courts require the parties to discuss settlement. So uh, there's no weakness to express an interest. It doesn't mean that the other side is weak or strong. It's something that you have to do in every case. And frankly, it's a bit ironic, but I think every case should be settled. Um, I have lots of trials and I've done lots of trials, but uh, I've thought every single case should be settled. And quite frankly, in every case where we got a great result, uh, there was an opportunity to resolve the case at a lower amount, which my client would have been very happy with. But sometimes, uh, you know, as they say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. What is mediation and why do most cases settle at mediation? Mediation is magic. I love mediation. I love mediation and the magic of mediation because it's a chance to talk in a confidential bubble. Nobody's allowed to know or to repeat what happened in your mediation bubble. And the mediation can't happen without a mediator. And again, our mediators are magic. They're either super experienced lawyers who've seen thousands of cases, as much as I've seen, they've seen 10 times more. Or they're judges who have seen trials, hundreds, hundreds of trials, and they just know more. Remember, it, it's to, to get a settlement is, is part your ability to predict what's going to happen. And mediators are magic because they're able to talk to both sides about issues that maybe they didn't think about that, that brings into better focus what may happen at trial. And, uh, you know, mediators won't force you. They won't, they don't make the decision for you. They, they facilitate a dialogue 
And you don't have to be in the same room either because it's really wacky and awkward to be in the room with the person who grabbed your bottom or who fired you while you were on a protected leave. Nobody wants to share air with the person that terminated them unlawfully or did something terrible to them at the workplace. And you don't. You don't have to. You don't have to share air. You don't have to see them. Uh, you, you show up at the mediation and the mediator crosses into each room and carries a message back and forth and ultimately a negotiation ensues. And sometimes it'll take multiple mediation sessions to get your case done. But if you have the opportunity to mediate, then you have an opportunity to settle your case. And the majority of cases that settle, especially with the Bohm Law Group, because we're always seeking top dollar settlements, uh, you don't get top dollar settlements usually without using a mediator. The best day in a case, the best day that a person can have in their litigation, no matter what, no matter what, the best day is the day that we get to give them their check. I, I love that day. I, I wish we could do it like uh, in those Adam Sandler movie where you got those big cutout checks that you march out. <laughs> you know, I wish it could be a full size check because uh, we're so happy to be able to get that get that compensation for a person so there's there's no doubt in my mind that the best day of every case is the day that the client gets their money and puts it in their account i'm, I'm so blessed to have received thank you cards uh fruit baskets uh one client even made a little model of me in a in a superman cape uh, and provide it to us. I I'm pleased and proud that some of our former clients uh, have become personal friends, uh, some even employees of the Bohm Law Group. I mean, the, the, the bond that you end up creating with a client when you are able to get them uh, justice is something that's just absolutely amazing. And, uh, and it's what every person should hope for in their case, is to have a feeling like it was all worth it and, uh, and that they're, they're so satisfied with the ability to get justice.